Let's see. This is the clicker right here? And maybe I go that way. Okay, okay. All right, so we're going to uh, talk about uh, principles of uh, controlled grazing, just a little bit more on the blackberries. I, I, I've done some uh, clippings on that, and even into uh, uh, August and September, you'll still be running 17% crude protein. So if you have goats, that can actually be a very good quality feed. Also, with the blackberries, you've got two different leaves. You've got a second-year leaf and a one-year leaf. If you were looking for eradication, coming in with maybe a spring grazing and then a fall grazing and then following up up again with the spring grazing would probably do a heck of a lot to really deplete uh, that plant that's uh, uh, being in here. I'm going to talk to you about some uh, principles of grazing and one of the things that I want to emphasize to you is uh, grass is your friend, okay? The more you have, the better you are, okay? Because that means that you don't have to be buying expensive supplemental energy or protein uh, to bring in from outside of your uh, farm. And whether you have a big place or a small place, you can manage Manage this resource. You're a grass farmer. You may raise sheep. You may raise cattle. You may raise goats. You may raise alpacas. You may raise llamas. Whatever. But what you really are is a grass farmer. And what we're talking about when we're grass farmers is we are looking to maximize the capture of solar energy by these green growing plants. And the longer we have those green growing plants, the better off we are. And then from there, we can bring in four-legged combines to harvest that stored energy that's above the surface of the ground. And then they are actually able to convert that into a saleable product. And the more we can emphasize that, the better the economics will run on our places. So we need to figure out, first of all, if we want to keep a lot of this stuff here, how does grass grow, okay? So, first of all, grass grows in the shape of an S-shaped curve, all right? Uh, if you come in, grass grows by capturing sunlight energy. So I've got to have leaves out there to be able to capture that sunlight energy. If I come in and I graze all the leaves off, what happens is... I can't capture sunlight energy if I'm a plant. The way that energy starts to happen again is I have to take energy from the roots that's only will last me for a couple of days to start some buds or some seeds germinating and then I start to grow a little bit. And when I'm growing very slowly at this point in time, then all of a sudden at some point I get enough leaves out there to where I can capture that sunlight energy and then I start to grow real, real fast. Then, if I have perennial grasses and no grazing occurs, what happens is I get taller and taller and taller and I start to look like me. I got gray, green kind of stuff, kind of old and decadent, all that kind of thing. So, uh, those are kind of the, the, the way that grass grows in the shape of an S-shaped curve. And so, they've defined those as phase one, phase two, and phase three. So, let's look a little bit more deeply into uh, how that works. This is phase one. All right. When we're talking about phase one, that means where we've really grazed down really, really short, okay, and we've removed most of that photosynthetic material, i.e. the grass leaves. So that means we have less leaves to capture sunlight energy. That means I've got to draw energy up from the roots. And there's also a hit that happens when I draw that energy from the roots because I get a root dieback. We're going to go out and look at some holes here in a little bit, and you're going to see the importance of having that root uh, structure down there. So there's less leaves out there. And because there's less leaves, I've got to draw that energy from the roots. It means my recovery period is longer because that takes a longer period of time. There's less roots because, again, of the root dieback. And so we, do, uh, we also, so from the plant standpoint, it's not good because I'm losing root structure. I can't capture sunlight energy very efficiently. I'm in very slow growth. From the animal standpoint, I have a lot of nutrients. This stuff is very high in protein and energy, okay? But the problem is I don't have enough quantity, all right? In other words, I, I like one uh, analogous phase for this would be on our rangelands in, say, January, where we have green fuzz out there, but we just don't have enough quantity to really satisfy the demand of those animals. So if you remember that old Miller Lite commercial, and this dates me, it tastes great, but it's less filling. So remember that bare soil does not make a good solar panel. Or if we graze things down very, very short like this, okay, that means we're not capturing sunlight energy. We've got to pull off and let those plants recover so we can get things restored again. So now, we'll keep going. 
Here is phase two. And that's the happy phase of the plant. Okay? As you can see, we've got all sorts of leaves out here to be able to capture sunlight energy. So we have plenty of leaves to capture that sunlight energy. If I graze from here down to here, I'm leaving enough leaf area so that I can get rapid recovery, uh, that as rapid a recovery as I can dependent upon the season of use. I have plenty, for, so it's good from the plant standpoint. There's, the roots are going to be happy. The stuff above the plant is going to be happy. So the plant's happy and the animal's happy as well because that feed right there even though it's not quite as high a quality as what we have here, it's pretty doggone close. We're high in protein, high in energy, so it's a good situation for the animal. So the plants are happy, the animal is happy. Okay? Then we'll go to the last phase, and that's phase three. And there is phase three. We've kind of got some old decadent plants out there. These are plants that keep growing and growing and growing. We don't clip them off of there. We're really talking about perennial plants when we're really talking about uh, phase three plants. The plant is too big. Okay, that perennial plant is so big that it can't capture enough sunlight energy during the day to replace what is lost at night at respiration. So that means the plant kind of goes into a stasis kind of a thing uh, or a senescence kind of a thing. The other thing is the outer leaves get up so tall that they shade out the center of the plant. The center of the plant can't capture sunlight energy. All of a sudden it starts to die. That, that dead center creates a mulch that then uh, encourages brush to come in. So the outer leaves shade out the plant. Also, that plant is increased in lignification. The only way it can stand upright is it has to transform from protein and energy to fiber. That's what allows it to stand straight. That's what lignification is talking about. It's higher in fiber. And so as a result, especially with regards to protein, there's less quality there. So this type of a situation for the animal is here's all this quantity, but the problem is can we get it to use it because it's low in quality. Okay? So the problem here is we're belly deep in grass, but we could be starving to death. And what we're starving to death for is protein. Okay? If we can supplement some protein, that can help this situation out. In other cases, we may just need to trample that to get in contact with the soil so we can start that cycling again. So remember that photosynthesis, which is the whole key thing to being a grass farmer, is uh, maximized in phase two. We don't want to be in phase one. That's because there's, we don't have enough leaf here. Here, if we go into phase three, we, we just have too big of a plant and we've got to, we've got to deal with that. So here's sort of the quality yield sort of conundrum, see? So we want to stay right in here because we'll have adequate quality for the animals uh, and also adequate yield for them and then the plant's going to be happy. If we don't give any rest at all, then we get into phase one situation where we don't have a lot of roots. If we give too much rest, well, then we have a situation where the plant's too big. So staying in phase two is a real key to being an effective grass farmer. So there's your phase one. There's your phase two, and there's your phase three. Let's talk about overgrazing, because you'll hear that term a lot, but it gets misused and misapplied a lot. Overgrazing is simply grazing a plant before it is recovered from the previous grazing. It occurs in only one of two ways. We are either going to stay too long, okay, and so we get a second bite on the plant on the, on the same grazing period, or we come back too soon. We give too short of a rest. So if we have a very long graze period, okay, and especially with perennial plants, we bite a plant, and then we walk away and maybe for 10 days the animal's over here grazing and then it comes back and all of a sudden it's got a choice. It can either graze that plant that's previously grazed or it can graze a plant right next to it that's gotten taller. What will happen is it will graze that plant that's previously grazed because it's shorter, it's more succulent. It's like the difference between ice cream and Brussels sprouts. Okay, So they're going to go after that. They'll get that second bite and that's when we have overgrazing occurs. When we overgraze, what's happening is we're tending to go more into phase one. If we go into phase one, we're going to have less roots for that plant. So it, it all starts to make things start to go backwards. If we come back too soon, that's paying attention to our 
rest periods. We have periods at right, right now from, uh, oh, say, March to about mid-May on our rangelands. A 30-day rest period will be more than enough for what we need. But then when we move into summer, when we move into winter, we probably need a 90 to 120-day rest period on our rangelands if we want to encourage the perennial plants that are out there. So we've got to pay attention to those required rest periods in order to not come back too soon on a plant. If uh, a plant needs 60 days of rest and we come back in 30 days, we'll have overgrazed it. Okay, Because again, it hasn't totally uh, uh, restored its root system. It's very important to understand that what's above the ground is important, but we're also managing for what's below the ground as well. So here's what we want. If we're here, we can graze down to here and then we're still capturing sunlight energy. If we pull off of there and don't come back to where we're here again, everything's going to be fine. If, however, we go to here and then we stay too long and get that second bite, and that's, it's not just going to happen with just that one individual second bite, but we do get that second bite repeatedly, this is what will happen. We won't have enough of a root structure, the plant will die out, we'll have bare soil, and then we'll have weeds. And eventually, you get into situations like this. You'll see this very classically in horse pastures because we'll tend to, only, tend to only have one or two animals out there. They very much selectively graze. And, uh, and so we have a bunch of overgrazed plants and then an ungrazed plants. This is phase one, this is phase three, and it'd be impossible to find a phase two plant out there. So we're inefficient in capturing our sunlight energy. This is what you want to avoid, okay? And so... What we're looking at here is just looking at our first principle of grazing. And it doesn't matter whether this is large or small acreage. With small acreage, you may have to do a little more tweaking, but you can still make this work. We want to adjust the rest periods to the growth rate of the plant. So when we're in rapid spring growth, we're going to have shorter rests. Okay? When we are in slower growth, we're going to have longer rests. So they're, they're interlinked. Okay? So the rest period is also interlinked to the graze period. A short, a short uh, uh, rest period means... It, intuitively you're going to have to have a shorter graze period. When you have a slower growth, you're going to have to go to a longer graze period. Here is another important point that I want you to take home. So we want to stay in phase two. The other thing is, especially if you are managing on irrigated pastures, for example, the effects of grazing residual on pasture daily growth. See, if I'm grazing down to about two inches, okay, my daily growth rate after I pull off of there is only about a little over 20 pounds uh, per day, 20 pounds per acre per day. If I'm grazing to a four inch level, I, I'm, I'm more than doubling what that growth rate is. I'm about at 45. If I'm grazing to about a six inch thing, I can be pushing up to 60 pounds per acre per day. So the point of all of this is, is if I'm really taking this all the way down here, okay, the reason why that's slow is we've got to mobilize energy from the roots to get enough top growth to start that growth happening real fast. If we're only grazing down to four inches, we're at the bottom of phase two and we can keep that growth rate rapid. So the amount of feed that we leave behind is very, very very critical. We're very good at knowing when we need to go in, but we're not as good at looking at what we need to leave behind. And too often we want to try and grab that extra day, but the problem is we'll move into phase one. So it takes grass to grow, to grow grass. And here's the uh, effect of the grazing residual on the required rest period. Again, if we're at uh, two inches here, and this would be during a period where we could get growth, this would be kind of a, this is it from Missouri data, but this would be analogous to our summers. You can see we're needing 45 days of rest. If, however, we're down here at about four inches, we're probably more at about 32 days of rest. And that's very, very critical, especially if you're trying to, uh, uh, to manage. Here's another thing that is talking about plant vigor, leaves, and roots. Again, the key thing is you're managing not only for what's above the ground, but also below the ground. Okay, here is an ungrazed area. Look at These are perennial plants, by the way. Look at all this root structure here. If we have grazed down 50%, you can see we're maintaining the root structure. Anytime you do graze the top of a plant, you're going to get some root pruning that will occur below the surface. That's some, uh, you'll get some of the, the roots will get released into the soil. That helps build more organic matter and feed all the soil microbes that are in the soil. So this is a good situation. But look at what happens if I go to 65 to 70%. 
See, we've taken this down even farther, and now look at the root structure. And what happens if we set stock, i.e. we don't give any rest at all to that plant? Look at that root structure. That plant will not survive. That's when we're going to have the weeds that Glenn was talking about. So part of the stuff on a strategy looking at weeds, okay, is number one, you may have to treat the symptom, i.e. spray, do whatever it's going to be, in order to give you a toehold to move, start moving forward again. But you've got to look at your management and seeing if that's contributing to that weed being out there in the first place. So with the old range management maxim is take half, leave half. And that's a solid thing that continues uh, to today. So here you see uh, the effect of defoliation on the percent of roots actively growing seven days after harvest. And you can see at 50% removal, okay, we're uh, at 40%, you're not having any effect at all, okay, on the percent of roots. At 50%, we are having some effect here. Kentucky bluegrass, we're not really going to have out here. Uh, but as you can see, we have sort of some minimal things. But look at what happens as you start to move into 60 and 70% on the percent of roots. Those roots are as important as what's above the soil. Keep that in mind. So for our uh, graze periods, we want to use as short a graze period as possible while maintaining adequate rest. We always want to hit the rest period right, and then we can go to the graze period. And we want to keep that short, or as short as we possibly can, because that will help encourage consumption. The first day I go out on the graze period, I want to eat everything, because it's like me being on a smorgasbord. Okay, there's all of this grass, and they'll eat and eat and eat. They'll actually eat more than what their requirement is. By the second day, they'll eat a little bit less. Third day, a little bit less. Fourth and fifth day, even more dramatically less. The reason why is they've taken all the good stuff, so now more fibrous stuff is there, walking around trample stuff, and poop and pee. Also, they'll tend to avoid those areas. So all those can have an effect on consumption. Here's a simple principle. The more you eat, the fatter you get. And when we're talking about livestock, that's what we want because that's pounds that we can sell uh, in, a, uh, 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 in an economical manner. The three controlling factors are grazing time, biting rate, and bite size. Here's five, that's a guy named Jim Garish. Uh, this is five bites from an excellent pasture. Here's five bites from a fair pasture. Look at the difference in the consumption. So if we keep pastures in good shape, we can keep animal performance high. Again, if we have been sort of nuking our pastures, there's just not as much quantity out there for those animals to be grazing. Again, remember that ruminants don't graze 24 hours a day. You got eight periods of grazing, eight periods of ruminant, eight hour, excuse me, eight hours of, of grazing, eight hours of ruminating, eight hours of sleeping. So you got to keep that in mind. Also, if we, depending on how much forage supply, if we're talking about cattle, they'll do 15 to 20,000 bites per day in good conditions. That's a lot of bites. But look at what happens. We double that in poor conditions. That's because they're having to go out there and hunt for that feed to see what's available. Sheep will graze six to eight hours per day in ideal pasture situations. But again, you can see that the biting rate is normally about 40,000 bites a day. But in, there, there's six hours, six to eight. We double that right here, and the biting rate doubles as well. So if you're seeing them grazing for a long period of time, that's probably an indicator that they're short of feed. Maximum intake occurs between 6 and 15 inch height, okay? But there's only a 23% correlation with that. However, grazing intake is 82% correlated with the amount of residual that you leave behind. So that's an important key point to take home. How am I doing on time? A couple more minutes, great. Uh, again, intake on cool season pastures is about 75% availability, okay, and 25% quality. That gets down to your management, especially management of that residual that you leave behind so we can get that rapid recovery coming back. So we've kind of hit that pretty good. I think the big thing there is just keep half, leave half. The way that we can uh, deal with uh, selectivity and grazing is we can increase the density. We've got two pastures here. Uh, we've got uh, uh, one head on a uh, uh, one acre pasture for 100 animal days. Here's 100 animals for one day on one acre. The stocking rate is the same. 100 animal days is getting taken out of both of these paddocks. If I've got one animal in 
there, I'm going to have a bunch of phase one and phase three because I can selectively graze. If I have a hundred animals in here for one day, I've got to eat what's in front of me because if I don't, my neighbor's going to get that. So we get all the plants utilized. So the more that we can increase the density, then the more we can do, handle uniformity of utilization. I just talked uh, with a guy named Neil Dennis in Canada. Uh, about two days ago, just called me up out of the blue. Uh, there's a concept that's starting to take hold uh, in other parts of the U.S. called uh, high, uh, stop, ultra high stock density or mob grazing. Neil is telling me he's putting a million pounds of beef per acre on his pastures and he still can't keep up with the feed. And the reason why is because he's, he's moving animals eight times a day. So they're only on a period for a short period of time. He's still managing the residual. He's only removing 40% of the plant. But he's getting all of this dung and urine is going right into the soil. And then he's moving off of there. And then he's maybe not coming back for about 60 days or 80 days. And uh, the growth is phenomenal. So... I got a lot of work to do to get more solid on that, but this is this has a lot of potential. So we want to use the highest stock density possible. Broom sedge you'll find in some of your pastures. If you use just a high stock density, high number of animals, short period of time, that the fertility dump of all that manure and stuff will really start to impact that broom sedge, which does not like fertility, i.e. it doesn't like competition. Uh, this is uh, talking about uh, uh, herd effect and just breaking that soil's crust. Uh, tools can be a tool of restoration. It doesn't have to be a tool, an implement of destruction with uh, compacting the soil. Uh, we just need enough herd size to be able to do this. Uh, there's pugging of pastures uh, here. This is uh, vinca, which is actually poisonous to goats. What was happening is these goats were being herded across uh, this uh, uh, area from one, there's a paddock over here, a paddock over here, they were getting herded across here, and even though that plant was poisonous, just the herding itself helped actually get that out of there. We're going to talk about matching stocking rate and ca carrying capacity out in the field. It's just you have to know how to be able to assess uh, your carrying capacity to get an idea on how to uh, stock your ranges. So the big take-home idea is here is that number one we have got to give adequate rest to our plants okay we adjust the rest periods to the recovery rate of the plant slow growth long rest fast growth short rest and on our grazing essentially we want to take half and we want to leave half if you can get those two principles right everything else you can start tweaking because that will allow you to get sustainable uh, and then we'll talk about this more out in the field